polar bears. Cute and cuddly, yeah, and dying, as are the fish, and the penguins, and people, and the US economy. Why, you may ask? Climate change and our wonderful leader, President Donald Trump. So first of all, what exactly is climate change? Climate change is an increase in average global temperatures caused by the emission of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and chlorofluorocarbons, which trap the sun's UV radiation instead of reflecting it back into space. On average, global temperatures have risen about 2 degrees in the past 200 years. While this might not sound like much, it actually affects Earth in a lot of different ways. Climate change leads to a higher frequency and severity of droughts, like the year-long one in California, the scorching heat waves, the 62 wildfires that burned 1.6 million acres across the western U.S., floods, and devastating hurricanes. Greenhouse gases also cause oceans to acidify, destroying aquatic biomes. The increase in temperature leads to melting ice caps and snow cover, as well as thermal expansion, causing sea level rise. This, in turn, affects ecosystems essential to our economy and to our Earth. All of this will lead to flooded coastal areas and islands, failed fisheries and farms, health issues, contaminated water, and countless other things. According to a recent study, in 2017, natural disasters exacerbated by the climate change cost the United States $306 billion. This money wasn't just sitting around, it came from taxpayer pockets, your parents' bank accounts. It's in everyone's best interest to help prevent this from getting worse and weakening our economy. So if climate change is such a big deal, what have governments around the world done about it? One example of an international goal to reduce greenhouse gases is the Kyoto Protocol by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC, which the US signed but never ratified. In its first commitment period, 37 countries and the European Union committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 5% below the 1990 levels between 2008 and 2012. In the second commitment period, parties committed to reduce emissions 18% below the 1990 levels between 2013 and 2020. The first phase of the Kyoto Protocol was very successful in that the countries participating exceeded their goals to reduce emissions. Through the creation of the carbon market and other programs, the Kyoto Protocol created incentives for emission reduction and climate change investments and costs for emissions. However, it was a failure in that the leading countries in greenhouse gas emissions did not participate in the Kyoto Protocol. <coughs> the United States. <coughs> Although it is difficult to make countries like China and India comply, as such an agreement could be a heavy burden on developing countries. Another international agreement by the UNFCCC to combat climate change is the Paris Climate Agreement. Their goal is to limit global temperatures to 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels and to help countries deal with the consequences of climate change. The Paris Climate Agreement went into action in 2016. 175 parties have ratified this agreement. The parties involved have agreed to share emission reports to each other and to meet every five years to update their goals as demanded by scientific studies. While the U.S. had initially adopted the agreement during the Obama administration, President Trump made sure to pull us out of it as soon as he could, claiming that the Paris Accord would undermine the U.S. economy and put the U.S. at a permanent disadvantage. He shares a conservative view on this issue, along with many other Republicans, believing reducing emissions harms industry, job creation, and efficient energy production. Under this agreement, the United States had promised to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 28% by 2025, which would have dramatically benefited the environment. Even though the national government pulled out of the agreement, 80 mayors of U.S. cities announced they would continue to follow the Paris Climate Accord guidelines. In stark contrast to our wonderful nation, other states around the world are taking more action towards cleaner energy and turning away from fossil fuels. Vietnam, an unexpected hero in climate change policy, is realizing that coal, while cheap and readily available, harms the health of people, the ecosystems, and the environment. Over time, the cost of coal due to its negative consequences grows more expensive than simply implementing clean energy sources. Surprisingly, lesser developed countries such as China and India are the ones realizing this first. It's really not a good look for developing countries with so much less infrastructure and technology to be ahead of us in the race to becoming green. Northern European countries such as the UK, the Netherlands, Norway, and France are planning on completing the future production of diesel and gasoline-powered cars by 2040. France, Sweden, and the UK are among the most successful countries in climate change policy, according to the Climate Change Performance Index. France created the Paris Climate Agreement, putting them at spot number four. In fact, French Prime Minister Emmanuel Macron roasted US President Donald Trump by ending a speech about the Paris Climate Agreement with the words, make our planet great again. Take that, Cheeto. 
Sweden takes the fifth place because of its superior recycling system, while the UK is cutting its coal power, earning its spot number five on the list. And what about the first three spots on the list? Apparently, the Climate Change Performance Index states that no country was good enough for these positions. Ouch. Why isn't the US on the list? Unfortunately, we haven't done Given that the U.S. emits a quarter of global greenhouse emissions, our failure to participate in climate change projects significantly holds back improvement rates. The Clean Air Act is a very comprehensive air quality law which restricts car emissions, allows for air pollutant emission inventories, and creates regulations for industrial pollution sources. The Clean Power Plan is an Obama administration policy written under the Clean Air Act. It was the first law to set standards for the amount of carbon dioxide that can be emitted from power plants. If put into effect, it was expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 32% in the power sector by 2030, where one-third of gas emissions originate. To do this, it would prevent any new coal plants from being built unless they could bury the emissions underground. However, Trump and EPA head Scott Pruitt wish to prevent this from being put into action, along with 14 other states that believe this plan extends beyond its legal limit. Trump signed an executive order for Pruitt to dismantle the CPP in early 2017. For over a year, it had lawsuits filed against it until the Supreme Court temporarily blocked the act until it could be agreed upon. Though climate change is not a very popular topic in the White House or on Capitol Hill, often due to fear of losing votes, the court system has been very busy regarding the environment. Since 2000, there has been over 1,000 lawsuits regarding environmental and climate protection. If the president and Congress won't listen and don't seem to care, where else can people turn to but the courts? This has proven to be a very effective tactic in drawing public and government attention to the topic of climate change and addressing solutions. For example, in 2007, the Supreme Court sided with Massachusetts in a case holding that the EPA is responsible for mandating CO2 emission regulations under the Clean Air Act. Government progress has proven to be painfully slow, but it is in fact picking up the pace. While the majority of our government has proven utterly useless in taking action against climate change, many states, including New York and California, and over 1,700 U.S. corporations are moving away from coal and towards solar, natural gas, and wind as energy sources, even if Washington isn't. Just because of their improvements, the power sector is supposed to have emission reductions from 27 to 35 percent by 2030. Many car companies are also implementing changes, such as Volvo making only electric and hybrid vehicles by next year, General Motors producing roughly two dozen electric models by 2023, and Volkswagen, which owns Bugatti, Audi, and Bentley, making hybrid and electric versions of all models by 2025. As consumers, we can still redeem our country's dignity and make change happen. The first step is changing the public perspective on climate change. Polls show that 69% of people agree that climate change is very real, but 38% believe it isn't a problem that they should be worried about because it won't directly affect them. They are very, very wrong. It is not just a minor inconvenience, but a major issue that can affect everyone in this lifetime and generations to come. One way to combat climate change is by reducing vehicle emissions. You can do this by using public transportation, riding the bike, or simply walking. For those of you who live in the suburbs where public transport and sidewalks don't exist, you can also carpool or use fuel-efficient vehicles, like an electric or hybrid car. You can also get more efficient light bulbs, plant a tree, recycle, and pull the plugs when you're not using your tech. Reducing our carbon footprint is essential to ensure the security of future generations. While the government may think that going green will hurt our economy, it will really only benefit in the long run if we save our natural resources and slow the agricultural and environmental consequences of climate change. Thanks for listening and make good choices. Save the polar bears.